Say, come bless the Lord. Say, come bless the Lord. Come bless the Lord. Draw near. Draw near to worship Christ. And bless his name. And bless his name. His holy his name. Holy Say, name. declare it. Declaring Back to the top. Come bless the Lord. Come bless the Lord. Come bless the Lord. Draw near. Draw near to worship Christ. And bless his name. And bless his name. His holy his name. Holy Declaring that he is good. He is Come on, take good. me out. Say, oh. Oh, that man would praise him. Oh, that man. Oh, that man would praise him. Say, rejoice. Him. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again. Again, I say. Again, I say. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say. Again, I say. Come on, take it up. Rejoice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We want you to rejoice with us this morning. Hallelujah. No matter where you are, come on, stand up on your feet and worship with us. Hallelujah. Come bless the Lord. Come bless the Lord. Come bless the Lord. Draw near to worship Christ. And bless his name. And bless his, his name. His holy name. Declaring. Declaring. Come on, take it out. Say, oh, that man. Oh, that man would pray. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Welcome to another service here at Hillcrest. It's March, so you have made it to level three of 2021 and we are still rolling. Um, last week was great, last month was great uh, because it was Black History Month and now we are just moving right along to March, getting closer to Easter. Um, one of the things we do want to take a moment and recognize is that a year ago about this time is when we had the tornadoes here in Nashville and we're still praying for the recovery in our city and for those impacted by that and other things such as COVID virus, COVID, uh, Corona, COVID virus 19, COVID virus 19. Y'all I'm messing up. Anyway, also we want to say happy birthday to the March birthdays. Uh, there's a lot of significant birthdays during this time. We just want to say happy birthday to you all. Anyway, uh, welcome back and enjoy the service. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Hallelujah. We want to give God praise this morning. Come on, right where you are, no matter if you're in your living room, your bedroom, I want you to stand up on your feet and I want you to worship God with us this morning. Come on, we want you to make that your sanctuary. Type in those comments, say happy Sabbath. Hallelujah. It's time to worship him. Hallelujah. Bless your name, O oh God. As we love on you, receive our love, receive our love. As we shout your name, receive our praises, receive our praises. Come on, y'all lift it up, say. As we Hallelujah. We want you to receive our love. Hallelujah. Receive our love. Come on, can we lift up the name of Jesus? As we shout Hallelujah. Your name. God, we want you to receive our praises. Receive our praise. Hallelujah. Receive our praise. Come on, say your name is high. Say your name is high. Hallelujah. The There's name, no other name, no other name like, like yours. yours. Hallelujah. Your name is high. We glorify we you, Jesus. Glorify. For you are great. You are great, you are great you are and great greatly to be praised. To be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We lift your name. We lift your name. Hallelujah. Come on. Can we lift up the name of Jesus in this place? Hallelujah. Bless your name, oh God. Hallelujah. Come on. As we love. You to receive our, love. receive our love, receive our love, receive our love. Oh, as we shout as your name, shout hallelujah, Jesus. Your name. We want you to receive our praises. Receive our praise. Glory. 
Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. As we love on you. Jesus. There's no other name like your name, oh God. Hallelujah. Say so your, your love is greater than ours. Say no one. No one greater. greater. Say so your, your strength is greater than ours. Say no one. No Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, if you know that there's nobody greater than God, come on, type it in those comments. Say, nobody greater. Say, say, no one is greater than ours. Say, no one is greater. Say, your strength is greater than ours. Say, no Good morning and happy Sabbath Hillcrest. I hope is all is well with you and your family and wherever you might find yourself today. I pray that God's blessing upon you and your household. Let's pray. Loving Father, thank you for being such a wonderful God. Thank you for being better to us than we can ever even imagine that, that you could be. Father, I pray that in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of the things that we face, I pray you keep our faith strong. I pray, Father, that you will do for humanity only what divinity can do. Father, we are so grateful for your love. We are grateful for your mercy. But Father, I, I just pause to say thank you. Thank you for just being God, for just being who you are. And that's who we that's who we call upon. That's who we need in these times in which we find ourselves. Jehovah Jireh. Thank you, Father, for being that provider for us. And and we'll forever be indebted to you for what you have done. But not only that, but what you're going to do. Father, we know that this too shall pass. Give us the stamina to hold on and not give up and not give in, oh God. For I know that a better day is coming after a while. And so, Father, ho hold our hand, oh God, lest we fall. I pray, Father, that you will allow us to continue to be the, a beacon, 
a light that's that's shining up on a hill. Father, we are so grateful for for what you've done and, and what you're doing through the members here at Hillcrest. And so, Father, we are, we're thankful for our pastor and his family. I pray that you would put a hedge about them, oh God. I know the enemy is not happy because week in and week out, our pastor has been preaching his heart out, oh God, and, and the enemy is upset. So I pray, Father, that you put a hedge around Pastor Reed and let not the enemy come nigh his dwelling. Father, I pray. I pray that sooner we be done with the troubles of the world. Father, we are going home to live with you. That's our prayer. That's our desire. That's what. We, that's why we come to, to, to get a closer walk with you. So, Father, I pray that you would be with our members that are sick. Comfort them, oh God. Do for them what they cannot do for themselves. And, Father, we every time we turn a corner... There's another set of family members that has lost another family member. And so, Father, I pray that you would comfort them in a very special way. Latanya Stalin's family, be with her children, oh God. I pray that you would cover them, shield them, oh God, and not allow the enemy to whisper in their ear those little subtle things that people don't care about you, that, that you are left to, your, to yourself now. You have to fend for yourself. Father, I pray that you would allow us to be, be what we need to be for them in the time of their need. So, Father, your children didn't come to hear me. They came to hear a word, oh God, that will motivate them, a word that will encourage them, a word that will keep them. So, Father, I pray that that as Pastor Reed gets ready to come, I pray that what he give us today will set our souls on fire and cause us, even those that have been in this church for many years, to say, what must I do? To be saved. Thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for being such a wonderful God. And Father, forgive me if I for for the things that I may not have said that I probably should have said or could have said. But having said that, have your own way today. All day long is Sabbath, so you do what you do best, O God, and minister to your children. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise, the honor, and glory. In Christ's name, we ask these blessings. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. We're so glad to be here with you today. My name is Clarence. And my name is Tatiana. And we just want to worship you all. We're just going to share um, one of our singles that's called Grace. And it simply talks about the grace of God and that it reaches to us even when we feel like we don't deserve it. His grace is still reaching towards each and every one of us. So we hope that you're blessed today.
Good morning and happy Sabbath, Hillcrest family and our virtual community. I pray that you've had a blessed week thus far. Um, so good to be here with you on this Sabbath. And we just want to continue to worship him through not only in song, but through his word today. Before I get into the word, I just want to take a moment just to encourage you to continue to keep all of our grieving families um, in your prayers, those who are lost loved ones and those who are experiencing health challenges in our community. Let's continue to keep those individuals lifted before the throne of grace as well. Well, I want to invite you to bow your heads with me as we prepare to dig deep into God's word today. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to open your word. Lord, we ask that you would transform this moment in time into a moment where our hearts become more aligned with you, where we see you more clearly. May our hearts be united to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin our conversation today by defining the word surrender. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines it this way, to yield to the power, control, or possession of another under compulsion or demand. Or it can mean to give oneself up into the power of another, especially as a prisoner. The word surrender has become increasingly unpopular in our culture, for it goes against our human nature as well as our American sensibilities. We're told from the time that we are children that we are to never give up no matter what, because to surrender is a sign of weakness. It is a recognition of defeat. And even if we find ourselves in a position where you have no choice but to surrender, we're taught that you must work, find a way to regain control at some point. While this word is frowned upon by many in our world today, surrender plays a crucial role in the journey of faith with Jesus Christ. If we are to truly experience the transformation of his life within, we must surrender to his love. The entire journey of faith hinges on our complete surrender to, to the love of Jesus. And that is what I want us to explore together today. What it means to surrender to Jesus' love in a sermon simply entitled, Surrender to Love. I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark chapter 10. And I want to read from the New King James Version of the Bible starting in verse 17. Mark chapter 10 starting in verse 17. Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good, but one that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Surrender to love. As Jesus prepares to leave and continue his journey throughout the region of Judea, a young man emerges from the crowd running frantically towards him. He does not want Jesus to leave without him getting an audience with him. As he makes his way into his presence, he kneels on the ground before him. And not wanting to waste any time, he asks him the most burning question in his soul. The one question that he has not been able to sufficiently answer for his entire life. What must I do to inherit eternal life? He is deeply concerned about where he will spend eternity if he will be a part of God's soon coming kingdom. 
However, his question is deeply perplexing, especially after his initial response to Jesus' answer to that question. It would seem he should know the answer to his own question, and we discover that based on what Jesus says to him. In verse 19, he begins his response by saying, you know the commandments. He answers the question by pointing to what he knows the young man already knows. The young man is proud of himself and with great joy, in verse 20, he says, all these things I have kept from my youth. You see, ever since he was 12 years old, the age of accountability in Judaism, where the responsibility of keeping God's law was placed squarely on the individual, ever since then, he had been meticulously keeping the laws of God. Ever since then, he has regularly attended the synagogue for worship every Sabbath, participating in all of its services, engaging in the ministry to the poor, and taking special care that he doesn't break a single one of God's commandments. He is somewhat relieved at Jesus' response. He He exhales, but the conversation doesn't end there. He was not in a, he was not in any way prepared for what Jesus was getting ready to say to him next. Jesus knows that no one will make it to heaven based on their good behavior, no matter how well they perform or how well they do at keeping up with the laws of God. He knows that even though he has years of good behavior under his belt, that he still doesn't really know God. And worst of all, he is in a lost condition. When God returns with his kingdom, he will not find a place there. Mark says Jesus looked at him. It is a look of salvific intent. He sees, it, he sees into his heart and is able to detect what is standing in the way of him and eternity. And the reason why he has not found peace in God after all these years of obedience to his commandments. He is on his knees in submission and surrender. But Jesus, but Jesus knows that his heart, that in his heart, he is still standing upright. He's doing all the right things and his behavior has the appearance of deep surrender, but it does not match the true attitude of his heart. He serves God out of duty, what he has been taught he should do because he is a Jew. And what he knows he has to do if he wants to be considered a good person in the community and to make it to heaven. However, Jesus does not look at him in judgment or condemnation. But Mark says that Jesus, looking at him, loved him. In other words, in that moment, Jesus' heart is filled with nothing but love for the young man. There's nothing he wants more than for him to know the love of God in his heart and why he confronts him with the one thing that is standing in the way of his eternal salvation. And that is complete surrender. The last thing that Jesus wants is for this young man to be eternally lost. That's what he says in verse 21. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross and follow me. Jesus reveals there is only one thing standing in the way. He has great possessions. Jesus is not trying necessarily to rid him of his possession because they are inherently evil, but because his heart finds security in what he possesses and not in his heavenly father. His call to give it all away is a call to a life where he has no choice but to depend on God and experience for the first time the true depth of the love and the care that only God can provide for his soul. 
As long as this part of his life remains unsurrendered, he cannot truly experience true salvation. You see, beloved, there is nobody else in the universe that knows us better than Jesus Christ. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He's able to see not only what we are thinking, but he knows what motivates us, the parts of our lives that are hidden from our view. He knows our intentions, that the, the, the things that we are not even aware of ourselves. He knows all about it. He knows where the idols are and how they have attached themselves to our soul. He knows the exact place where we have not surrendered to him. And so, because he loves us, and because he wants us to experience more fully his love, he searches through every room in our hearts, looking for the strongholds, exposing places where we have put our confidence in instead of him so that he can smash them to smithereens. His call to surrender is a call to reckless abandoned abandonment to him. It is really, beloved, a call to surrender to his love. When he reveals to us our sins, hear me now, and the places hidden from our view. See, there are things in our hearts that are hidden we can't even see because of our own sins. So he has to come, he has to do the miraculous work of confronting us and exposing us to the places that are standing in the way of our relationship with him. That's what the gospel does. He does this not because he is trying to deprive us of anything. It is because we have allowed something else, someone else, to take his place. That's what's at stake. When Jesus confronts us about something in our lives, it is because we have allowed it to take his place. And because it has taken his place, we are not able to experience fully the depth of his love in our hearts. Some years ago, I was talking to a young man who was asking me what was wrong with drinking alcohol. And as we were talking, the Holy Spirit impressed upon my mind and revealed to me the reason why people drink. It was not necessarily the problem with alcohol, per se. He revealed to me that people drink either and we know this, to relax themselves at the end of a long day. Or some people, uh, they drink in order to, to lift their mood uh, so that they can feel good. Some people drink to drown out their problems. They don't want to deal with all of the things going on in their life. So they just need just a, a few moments where they can escape in a drink. Some people drink because it gives them more confidence in social settings. It, it makes them more bold. They say things that they wouldn't normally say and do things that they wouldn't normally do. It's not so much the taste that the people love, but how the alcohol makes them feel. In other words, the problem with alcohol is that it takes the place, hear me now, that is only supposed to be reserved for God. We use alcohol to do what Jesus wants to do inside of our hearts. See, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that the Lord has placed eternity in our hearts. In other words, the Lord has placed in us a longing for him that only he can fill. And unfortunately, we try to fill that space with everything but him. We find security in everything but him. We want things and people to do for us that only God can do. And so your struggle might not be alcohol. It may be feeling like you're not all that significant or not really valued. So you find other ways or people to fill that space that make you feel valued. Maybe you find satisfaction or meaning and significance in your career or how much money you have in your bank account. Maybe it's what you achieve 
Or maybe you try to escape how, how you feel by binge watching on next Netflix or shopping. Maybe your heart skips a beat when you post something on Facebook and Twitter or Instagram and people like it because it makes you feel loved or valued. Or maybe you try to fill the hole in your heart with religion. You go to church because that is what you were taught to do growing up, and that makes you feel confident about your relationship with God. Maybe you try to do good to others because you think it will earn you a place in heaven. Maybe you think that a regular devotional time will save you in the kingdom. Whatever we do to fill whatever void in our lives that, that is only supposed to be reserved for God. That doesn't mean that you can't meet God through these religious practices, but they cannot do for us. They're, they're supposed to be an a on-ramp, a gateway into the presence of God so that he can do for us what none of those things can do. None of those behaviors can fill the hole in our hearts. And so Jesus knows that in order for us to experience his love, that we have to come to the place of complete surrender. He has to turn our attention right to where our idols are. He causes us, when he confronts us, to look at ourselves in the mirror. That's what the gospel does. It only reveals to us our idols. It only confronts us on our sins and our true selves. But this happens so that we can see our need for him and turn to Jesus in surrender to his love. That's what the gospel does. It's twofold. It confronts us on our sin so that we can see how wretched, blind, wretched, and poor we are. But then we also can see that the only person that can satisfy our need is Jesus, not our sins. Jesus calls, Jesus calls us to a place of decision like he did the young ruler. Where we have to choose between him and our idol. And the question is, the hindrances that relates to our surrender that causes us to hesitate even with our idols, even though in the, the rich young ruler is staring in the face of God, is extending the invitation of salvation to him. But the reason why he's unable to surrender is because he has not yet been convinced by the love of God. He doesn't believe that the love of God is able to keep him and provide for him and sustain him. The question is of surrender at the core of surrender is will, one writer says, is if we will allow ourselves to fall into the fiery abyss of God's love. It is just falling back into his love, trusting that he can catch us. That's what surrender is about. It's not about stopping or depriving us from something, but it's about, it's Jesus' call to himself. He wants us to come into this intimate relationship with him where we can bathe and bask in his love and rely on him to take care of us. The question is, will we trust God with our whole heart even when we don't know what will happen next or how he will provide. That's what happened with the rich young ruler. What Jesus was asking him to do would require tremendous faith. And he wasn't willing to do that. The young ruler is so deeply disturbed by Jesus. It's his command. It's a command, by the way. He doesn't know what to do. That's how disturbing this is. He didn't see this coming. Until now, hear me now, he has not had a problem since he was 12. He, he has not had a single problem with not one of God's commandments. He kept them. He kept them before his eyes. But this command goes to the heart of the matter. It goes to the question of where is his heart? And it's too much for him to bear. 
It will cost him too much. Everything he has built for himself, everything that he has achieved, Jesus is asking him to abandon it, to fall into the abyss of his love. And it's too much to ask. When he hears Jesus' words, it, it saddens him. He is severely disheartened, the Bible says. He is sad at his word. He is stunned at his word. His heart is filled with sorrow because of what Jesus says to him. His heart is saddened because he has great possessions. He knows the cost. Jesus was calling him to abandon all for him, but the ask was too much, and it leaves him saddened. He rejects Jesus' invitation. The word there when he says, take up your cross, and the word for follow me is the same word that is used for when Jesus was calling all the other disciples who, by the way, abandoned their professions and their families to be with Jesus. But this young man couldn't do it. In other words, the word that he used to call the other 12 was the same word he used to call him. He could have been maybe the 13th disciple. But it was too much. And because of the cost to him personally, he rejects Jesus' invitation. His decision, hear me now, reveals that he cared more about himself than God. He loved himself more than he loved God. And because of this, he puts himself first. He loves himself first. Inspired Pen says, self first is the theme of the doctrine of hell. Satan is working to make selfishness worldwide. She also says, the sin of selfishness is the most contagious of all sins and the root of many spiritual disorders. Selfishness. It is this sin that separates us from God. But in God's economy, she says, it is the exact opposite. Self-surrender is the substance of the teachings of Jesus Christ. Jesus' call is always a call to surrender to his love. This is what he did on the cross. He doesn't call us to do anything that he didn't do. What, this is what he had to do. He had to surrender to his father's love and trust that he would raise him from the dead on the third day. He had never experienced that kind of separation from his father before, but he surrendered to his father's love in order to save us. He didn't just confine himself to time and space, but he died. He died the second death, the death of no return. He surrendered to the love of God. That's what he, he did it, and that is what he's calling us to. That's true faith. It is always a love for self. Let me say it another way. It was his love for self why Lucifer fell from heaven in the first place. He loved himself more than God's son. The war in heaven was about his place. And he didn't like God's order. He didn't like what he was saying. And so he wanted it his way. And love for self was man's original sin in the garden. For love for self lies at the root of all rebellion. In the garden, we placed our needs above God's. We put our desire for greatness over God's desire for obedience to his love. She wanted to be great. It was because she loved. In that moment, she chose herself over God. And it said, and self lies at the root of all rebellion. Selfishness, self first, it's the doctrine of Satan. We see this love for self even in popular Christianity today. As we're now in the wave of a gospel that is centered on the self primarily. The main actor is not Jesus anymore. The story is not just about God, but it's about us. We're co-stars. 
We can know a gospel is false when it is only preoccupied with the self. Self Self-achievement, self-determination, and not self-surrender. When self is deified, when it's made holy, when it's made supreme, the most important thing, then when every trial come, it is about taking us to the next level, to a new season. And there is no mention of repentance, confession, self-sacrifice. When that is not a part of the teaching, it's a false gospel. When there is no mention of our need to surrender to Christ for his glory and not for our own, it is because we want something great to happen for ourselves, then it is a false gospel. Jesus' call is a call to experience his love and live for his glory alone. The rich young ruler would have to abandon everything just for Jesus. That's what the gospel demands. And it's not a chore. It is to spend time with the creator of the universe, the one that put the the color, the hue in your eyes, the one that numbers every hair on your head. It's a call to experience the one that breathed his breath into your lungs to come close to the one that causes our hearts to beat. The self-centered gospel is about our dreams, our achievements. It never makes a call to sacrifice and surrender. It focuses our attention on our haters, the people who we believe are obstacles to our greatness and how we should use them for motivation to go to the next level. But what if God is allowing the trial and the setback because he is trying to reveal something about the condition of our hearts? What if that's his goal? What if it's not about the other people? What if it's not about what you're getting ready to accomplish? What if it's about eternity? Is it possible that God is most concerned with our relationship with him than what we accomplish for him. Is that possible? Is that why Jesus died? Or did he die to save us from ourselves and from sin? The young ruler had only partially surrendered to God, but when it was time for full surrender, It was difficult because he had not been in the practice of surrendering all. You see, beloved, Christ's call to us is a call to surrender all. It is the only way to experience his love. It's not just a call to to, to turn away from our sins, but to turn away from ourselves. Interesting, the man walks away from Jesus. But notice what the disciples say. They're they're shocked by this. Verse 23, we're almost done. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is for those who trust, notice the nuance, those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. Not a problem with the riches, but the trust in the riches, where your security lies. Where's your idol? Where's your trust? Where is your confidence? Notice what he says, 25. He says, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. He's using, using hyperbole. The needle is the smallest thing in that time, and the camel was the largest animal in Palestine. He says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man, a man who trusts in his riches. Talking about the rich young ruler. Whatever we have that we have more confidence in, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for us to enter into the kingdom of God. The disciples are astonished. Here's another reason why they're so surprised. Because the rich were considered to be blessed of God and though their place in the king, and, they, and thought that their place in the kingdom was secure. But here Jesus shows that a person can have misplaced confidence 
in even his blessings and miss the kingdom of God. You can be blessed by God and, and, and be so into the gift that you forget the giver. Some of us are more focused on what we can get from God than God himself. And whenever that happens, it means it reveals that our confidence is not just in God. Young ruler, unlike many rich in his day, hear me now, this is what's interesting about this. He had not, many of the rich in the day, had a lot of them have gotten it by ill-gotten gain. They had taken advantage of people. But the rich young ruler, that was not the case. He had not stolen a dime. He had not taken advantage of a single person. He went to church. He had means. He was educated, but he didn't know God. He was lost. He is what we would call today a good person. But he didn't have faith in God. He had not surrendered all. We can do all of these things and not be surrendered to God not surrender to his love. The problem is not in his wealth so much so, but the fact that he had attached his confidence to wealth. Now, we can justify, you know, well, I, I, I'm not, my confidence is not there, but God knows. He calls, it, he calls it the deceitfulness of riches, chokes out the cares of this world. So there's, a, there's an allure there. But it it also shows where our confidence is. Perhaps there's something in our lives that we're holding on to and we don't want to let it go. What is it? But hear me now. Don't worry about what you might lose. But look at what you stand to gain. Not just eternity, but more than that, who you gain. You gain the person of Jesus Christ. So the question of surrender is not not so much about what we're willing to give up, but who we're willing to surrender to. Now, this sounds difficult and hard. Let me tell you something. Surrender is probably one of the hardest things. Remember, it's one of the most contagious of all sin. But I love what Jesus says in verse 27. The disciples were so shocked. In verse 26, I want to say that, and they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? If this rich man that kept the Sabbath, that never did anything wrong, if he can't be saved, who then can be saved? That's what Jesus says. With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. In other words, it doesn't matter how, what, how, alluring or how much in the grip of our idol we find ourselves. It doesn't matter how much is it we've are, it's been attached to our souls. You may be thinking right now, you know what God is saying to you in this moment. You, you know that you have not fully surrendered to his love. You know what it is. And you're wondering how in the world are you going to give all that up for him? With man, it is impossible. But with God, it is all things are possible. It's a work that God does. He will bring us to the place. The question is, will we respond in faith? And here lies the rub. And I'm going to close with this. What is needed is what happens right before the story of the rich young ruler. In Mark's gospel, he's setting it up. It's a contrast. Notice what he says in chapter 10, starting verse 13. He says, then they brought little children to him that he might that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. Hear me now, for such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Jesus uses the children to show what true conversion is and what true faith and surrender is. Children, when they come to you, they have no preconditions. They're willing to come. And he's saying, 
that that is the kind of attitude that we need to have. We will not receive the kingdom of God unless we have the humility and the simplicity and the trusting of the heart of a child. The trusting heart of a child. That's the only way that we can receive the kingdom of God. And that is a work that Jesus does for us. Came across a story. One night, a few cars were speeding along a main highway between Jackson and Fixburg, Mississippi, the story says. The drivers had faith in their cars and and the bridges over the stream. Apparently, they were driving on this road, and they were passing over some of the bridges at 50, 60 miles per hour. People were having a good time. Everything was lovely, and everything was going fine, when suddenly, one car was driving on the bridge, and all of a sudden, it just kind of disappeared. It had fallen. Apparently, a part of this bridge had come apart, and in the dead of night, they couldn't see it until it was too late. And so one driver who was driving with the other group, his car fell in there. But when, he, when the car fell into the stream, he managed to kick out the, the front screen and get out of the car. But he was dripping wet. And so he went up to the, climbed up to where the bridge was, and he was trying to fan down all the cars to stop. But nobody would stop and listen to him. And so cars went off, fell into that hole. They didn't trust him. And I want to suggest to you today that Jesus, when he comes to us, he's warning us. He's fanning us down. But we would rather put our trust where we want to trust. But I want to suggest to you today, there's only one bridge to cr- across the gulf of death. And that is the person, Christ Jesus. He comes. And he waves to us. He waves to our hearts. And it's only through him that we can be saved from eternal ruin. The question today is will we surrender to his love? Will we trust his love and abandon all for the sake of having him? Father, well, for many of us, this was a difficult word today. But Lord, today, it is our prayer that your love shine through. Help us to see what's at stake, that our entire relationship with you, that without this surrender, we cannot fully experience your love. And it is in response to your love that we surrender. And so, Lord, open our eyes that we may trust your love. May we be be willing to forsake all for you. And may we experience all that you have in store for us in yourself. This is our prayer in the wonderful name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Let everyone say, Amen. Well, it's that time again, folks. I hope that you all are staying safe. I hope that you received something that you needed this week from the service. Please remember to subscribe, give us a thumbs up, share it with who needs to hear it, and please join us back here next week here at Hillcrest.